We're talking today with Nathaniel Nichols, better known to his friends as Nick. Dr. Nichols' reputation in the control uh, area stands, speaks for itself. His career spans most of the important events in control in the 20th century. And our goal today is to get to know Nick a little bit better, to take a look at his history, and then to ask him how he feels about uh, the progress of control in this century uh, at this stage of his career. Nick, I want to start out by asking about uh, your upbringing. You were born in central Michigan uh, at the beginning of the First World War, and the details of your birth are, are kind of interesting in, in light of where technology has gone this century. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, my father and mother met while he was working on a farm where she was living. They were married and they went to live in a small log cabin not far from both the farm where he, where the, where he had worked and she was staying because her father had died and so she was staying there with her uncle. But anyway, the time came to get a doctor and I think my father walked, but I'm not sure. Anyway, some way or other the doctor appeared on December 31st, 1914. He came by sleigh, didn't he? You were telling he came me. by cutter. Yeah. Now a cutter is a one-horse sleigh. Something like the one famous one-horse shay, but this one's a sleigh. And the, the horse is able to steer it under the guidance of the driver because they're, they're wooden fills that go around the side of the horse. John, would you mind doing the introduction again? We're going to take this from the top. Okay. Give me a signal when you're ready. We're talking today with Nathaniel Nichols, better known to his friends as Nick. Nick needs no introduction to the control community. He, he's one of, the pre, one of the premier figures in 20th century control. He's been present at many of the uh, signal events uh, of control in this, in this decade. In the act, uh, can we try that again? I'm sorry. This will probably take more time than anything. <laughs> We're talking today with Nathaniel Nichols, better known to his friends as Nick. Nick needs no introduction to the control community. He's one of the premier figures in control in this century. He's been lucky enough to be present at many of the important events in control that have transpired uh, since World War II, and in fact, through World War II. Our goal today is to talk to Nick, to get to know him better, to learn a little bit about his past, to see how he views uh, his work at the Radiation Laboratory at MIT during World War II, and to see how he feels about control at this stage of his con career. Nick, I want to start off by asking a little bit about your, uh, your origins. You, know, you were born in Michigan near the end of, uh, near, the, near the beginning of World War I, uh, right at the end of 1914. And the details of uh, your entry into this world are interesting to me, because I, I think it is, will be interesting to the, uh, to the, uh, to the viewers too. So why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, how you got started. Well, um, I was born on December 31st, 1914 in a log cabin in the central part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Now, nowadays, since I live in California, I have trouble even remembering the December 31st at the region, region where I was born. There's snow on the ground and it's cold. So somebody had to go, some, some way the doctor had to be gotten to the 
this cabin, which was in Isabella County. And it turns out to be about a half a mile south of a farm that my father later bought. It's a log cabin, right? A log cabin. And so the doctor came to deliver me. Of course, I don't remember this. I was told this. And he drove a one-horse cutter. Really, it's, it's not necessary to say a one-horse cutter. A cutter has only, is only made for one horse, and it has only one pair of runners. <coughs> the steering is done by the fact that the horse just leans into the wooden fills that are along the side of the horse under the guidance of the driver and pulls the sleigh over one way, or, pulls the cutter over one way or the other. So we get our first control problem right here, even before you're in the world. Yeah, well anyway, the doctor had no problem doing that. As I recall, I think I was told my father walked about seven miles to the doctor's office to get him to come, come and deliver me. I'm not quite sure on that point anymore. <coughs> I do know that my birth was registered on December 31st, 1914 with the records maintained in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, which is the county seat of Isabella County. So as time went on, my father then bought a 40-acre farm, complete with a mortgage. Did he do this before you moved to California or after? Long before we moved to California, that's right. Someplace around the time you're 10, you move on to California with your... With your yeah, we parents. moved, well actually we lived in this, on this farm for some time, and my father farmed it, uh, raising corn and oats and barley. And in fact, I had several, I eventually had four brothers and two sisters. Not most of them born, let's see. Another sister died actually at childbirth, I believe. There were four brothers, right? Though. So I had four brothers that were alive, say in 1930 and two sisters. In fact, the two sisters were alive then, and, and two sisters are still alive. In fact, I expect to see them in a, a few weeks from now. I had one brother that enlisted in the Marines before he ever finished high school. Fortunately, he didn't get killed in the, the Marine siege of uh, or in landing on hmm, the island made famous by the flag put on the... Oh, Iwo Jima? He was at Iwo Jima, your brother? Iwo Jima. Yeah, it's interesting. During the Iwo Jima session, he turned out to be in sick bay, down with malaria. <laughs> he was very lucky. So he didn't get in the... didn't get in that, but he got back to Michigan after the war was over. Unfortunately, he was, he then died in a, I guess I'd call it an accident after that. So he is no longer with us. I had another brother who was in World War II and he was in the Navy and flew out of North Africa. After the war was over, he came back to Michigan and he in turn uh, suffered an illness and died quite some years ago. Do you remember your California very well when your father went out there about 1923 or so? Well, in about 1920, for some reason, well, uh, my father had learned to become a carpenter, partially at least. And my mother had an uncle who lived in Huntington Beach, California. Mm -hmm. And he had written to either his mother, who would of course have been my great-grandmother, or 
maybe he wrote directly to mother, my mother, I'm not quite sure, and said, well, if you're a carpenter, there's lots of homes being built in Southern California, in Huntington Beach, Santa Ana in particular. So we got on the train. We went up to Farwell, Michigan and got on the train. <laughs> the Ann Arbor Railroad, it was called, which went down, as I recall, to Lansing and from there went on across the country and eventually ended up in Los Angeles. And I don't remember. I think that we were met at the, at, in Los Angeles by this uncle who then took us out to Huntington Beach and we lived, I think, in his garage for a while. Hmm. In the meantime, my father acquired a car, a Model T Ford it was in those days. Very complicated gear shift on a Model T Ford. It has three pedals and a handle on the side for the brake. The brake was a cast iron brake shoe which could wear out or, or brake rather easily. I should say that was a parking brake. It also put the car in the neutral. And in California, that was not a bad neutral because it was usually fairly warm there. Turns out a Model T Ford in Michigan, that neutral is not a very good neutral because you have to slide some plucked plates, some steel plates past each other, and then when the oil gets cold, they don't slide very well. But nevertheless, so we, he, oh, one time I, I do remember something else which was quite interesting at the time. My, I, in the meantime, I, my sister had been born out there, my present oldest sister, Elizabeth, Edith, Edith. She was born, as I recall, after we had moved to Santa Ana. And so we had this car, and here we are. We we're going to drive out and see the orange groves. Because there were orange groves out toward a city called Riverside. So my father gets in the car, and we all get in, and we drive out there. And... Uh, we stop alongside the road because there's a beautiful orange tree with oranges right on the ground. And we, we jump out and we grab an orange, which of course is not quite the proper thing to do, but you can't stop an eight or ten year old from hardly anything, <laughs> even today. And so we peel it and start to eat it. Well, I don't know whether any of you ever, have ever peeled a grapefruit. But when you think it's an orange, you, you peel off the skin, but that skin, which remains on the grape, on the sections of the grapefruit, is pretty bitter. That was my first time I had ever seen a grapefruit in my life. <laughs> we used to have oranges in Michigan at Christmas, which is about the only time we had oranges, and they would peel all right, but the grapefruit were brand new to us. Your father's experience in California was not good, I guess. Because well, actually, I think that was about 1920 or 21, and there was a, the Depression out there. They stopped building houses. Before then, they had been building the so-called California bungalows, and he built several of those. So, there was no more work. So, we... I think maybe we'd already had a round trip ticket, but anyway, we got on the train and we went back to Michigan. We got back to Michigan. As I recall, we got back there in about March. Well, if you're picking a time to get back into the central part of the southern peninsula of Michigan, March can still have rains, it can still have snow, and it still have freezing. And I think I do remember that I was able, able to, hardly able to walk on the roads because it was so slippery. This was in March. But nevertheless, my father now owned this farm. It had one house on it, which we had lived in, which he converted to, the, to a chicken coop. Hmm. And then he got together with there was lots of cooperation in those days. He got together with some other farmers, and they, I think they got about 10 teams of horses together. 
and there was a house, a two-story house, which sat on a farm about two miles directly east of where our 40 acres was. So they put some logs underneath the, they jacked the house up with jacks, hmm. these big jacks that you, screw jacks that don't reverse. So you can jack the house up and you slide these logs underneath and you, well you picked a pair of logs that had sort of runners in the first place and there's snow and ice on the ground. So they just come across country with that hmm. house and they erect it on our farm. So that's where we spent a fair amount of years then in that house. And at which time I was now going to grade school in the in one of the typical one-room schoolhouses, which were the common thing in central Michigan. And those, well, they're a common thing all over the country. So-called little red schoolhouse, except ours was yellow brick. <laughs> and I walked two miles to school in the morning and two miles back at night with some of my cousins who were around the area. And eventually, but by this time, my father began to feel that farming was not what he really wanted to do. So he decided to move to, I think it was down near Detroit. Yes. Well, first of all, I think he started working on carpenter work around the farm. For one thing, he built a, built a two-story roof only, which included a place that cows could be kept, and then you could put hay in the whole thing. And that barn then was now left on the farm, and we moved to Detroit into the Detroit area, down near Troy, Michigan. This is before you started college. At, uh, oh, this is long before I started college. So you weren't on the farm, you didn't, uh, you know, Mount Pleasant's pretty close to uh, central Michigan, so you weren't there at the time you started. Well, when I finally finished high school, which I finished high school from Mount Pleasant, Mount Pleasant High School after having driven a car 45 miles a day to get in and back and milking two cows before I left, I don't know whether there are two or four cows, but anyway, it takes a while. <laughs> so finally in 1932, I graduated from high school in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, at the Mount Pleasant High School. Had two remar had remarkable teachers there. I had a chemistry teacher by the name of Dr. Meiskens, a math teacher, Miss Montague, and a journalism teacher whose name momentarily escapes me. Anyway, these were remarkable high school teachers. They saw to it that I got through high school and learned something about algebra and even advanced algebra and geometry. I don't recall what I took. I may have even taken solid geometry in high school. In the meantime, we stayed out on that farm and, well, no, in the meantime now, my father decided he would move that house into Mount Pleasant. The house has been moving a lot here. Yeah, it, it got moved into Mount Pleasant, and I think still stands there. It happens to be quite near the Central Michigan University on South Main Street. I think for a while it was set in a different place, but nevertheless, uh, we got moved in there, and I had these brothers and sisters that went to high school in Mount Pleasant. And one of my sister's big complaints, high school, you shouldn't have any trouble with this. Nathaniel had no trouble with it. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> this is in algebra or, or geometry, probably. It's the curse of being a younger child, I guess. That's a way. choice source. Yeah, you should, never, you should never be a younger child, I guess. Or... Probably the thing that you, most high school teachers should realize they should never compare brothers and sisters. 
1932 when you start in at uh, Central Michigan University. So then in, then in Central, 1932 this I is, started This is Central. the height of the Depression. How do you finance this at college education at this point? Well, now that was an interesting little thing. Three of those high school teachers decided I should go to, high, to college. Hmm. So between the three of them, they raised... Oh, there was another thing I did before that, while we were still on the farm. But let me say, between the three of them, they raised enough money to pay my tuition. I'll be there. So you're actually your high school your high school teachers helped my you get in. My high school teachers helped me get. They really helped me the second semester, the second term. There were terms in those mm -hmm. days at that school. I should have said before that, while we were still on the farm, before I even thought I was going to do anything except maybe finish high school. But a fire broke out on a, we used to call it the mountain, it was about a mile west of where our farm was. And a fire is a terrible thing to have with a lot of pine trees around. And so I get over there and they put me to work fighting fire which means with a hoe, maybe with an axe, but mostly with a hoe. And you just keep fighting that fire until it's put out, 24 hours a day. Well, I mean, you might have laid down for a little while someplace, but this was in the spring, or in the summer maybe, I guess it was in the summer. So I got enough money out of fighting that forest fire to pay my first year's tuition. Hmm. Our first, first semester, first terms tuition. There were three terms. Now, when the second term rolled around, is when I, when my high school teachers decided that I should keep on going to school. But you got four more years, three more years to go here. Three more years to go. Well, actually, there was no problem after that because then I got a job on campus, uh. sweeping out the shop and taking care of the of the distilled water still in the chemistry lab and. There are lots of jobs on a, on a college campus. Well, one of the things I did was to distribute the handbills for the, the local concerts, local entertainment, which was held in the auditorium. You told me uh, that uh, you, went down, you went to that university to learn as much as you could learn about chemistry, physics, and mathematics. Yes. While I was there, I took all the chemistry, all the physics, and all the math courses they taught including trigonometry, calculus, advanced calculus, and only one course in physics. I think I took a course in organic chemistry as well as chemistry and had a remarkable or chemistry teacher and physics teacher. One thing, my physics teacher there uh, was a tall fellow who had finished a doctor's degree in Germany. <laughs> This was back in the days before anybody had any clear understanding of semiconductors or anything of that sort. But he'd gone to Germany, and his doctor's degree involved seeing if, if there was any way he could figure out how the difference between copper and silver mixed up and rolled out together for conductivity, or when it was made into an alloy. It turns out there's a difference in the electrical conductivity hmm. when it's an alloy rather than when it's not an alloy, when it's just a mixture, mixture of filaments particularly. The other thing he did was he played tennis, which never took on me either, but he was a <laughs> remarkable tennis teacher. <laughs> well, anyway, I took all those courses, and it, when I did graduate in 1936 from Central Mich what was then called Central State, Central Michigan College of Education, I think, mm -hmm. CMSC. The, the University of Michigan had allocated to the Central the ability to choose one graduate that would get a, a tuition-free scholarship at the University of Michigan for one year. So it was a foregone conclusion. I then went to down to Ann Arbor and 
In the meantime, I had high college and high school classmates from, from Mount Pleasant who were already in Ann Arbor. So with, through one of them, I was joined a fraternity down there, a graduate fraternity it was called, hmm. the Gamma Alpha Graduate Fraternity, which was quite close to the university. So I embarked on a course of being a physicist. But I did something else, which I think is a poor piece of strategy. I went down there and I wanted to do a thesis in a particular area. It turned out to be an area that I had done some work at, even I think got a patent, which may be in the list of patents, I don't mm -hmm. remember, on something called the polarograph, or the cathode ray polarograph it was called, because I had worked some, worked some summers over at Dow Chemical Company. Mm -hmm. And so I persuaded a professor to let me work on this, but that's a poor scheme because distractions came along. For one thing, I got, it wasn't a distraction. Fortunately, I got married sometime while I was at Ann Arbor to a nurse who'd come over from Mount Clemens. Kay. My wife Kay, who was in town with me that day. And uh, but anyway, most of you may not remember now, but in, in, the, in that period, there was something called World War II going on. <laughs> and the time came to decide what you're going to do about World War I mean, are you going to get drafted or what? Or are you going to get in the, going to enlist? Or? And so I, uh, in the meantime, my brothers had done what I suggested. They, they'd stayed back, though, in Mount Pleasant. They hadn't gone to Ann Arbor. Although one of them, I recall, as I recall, had started school at Central. So... So, Nick, around 1940. Oh, okay. So, Nick, around 1940, you leave Ann Arbor and uh, take a job with Taylor Instruments in New York to uh, contribute to the war effort. Tell us a little bit about Taylor Instruments in those days. Well, the chief engineer of Taylor Instrument Companies had been through Ann Arbor, and I had an interview with him. Mm -hmm. And at this time, I was still expecting to write this thesis because I had done the, the experimental work. So I, <clears throat> he asked me to make a, a trip then to be interviewed at the home of the, at the factory of the Taylor Instrument Companies. It's plural. Mm. It's quite a, it, was, it was quite an old firm having gotten started as a Taylor Brothers company before that. And of course, I was expecting to finish my doctor's degree, and so was he expecting me to finish it. But I went out for the interview. I could have also gone as an interview to Corning Glass, because they'd come around. But I decided not to visit Corning Glass. I just visited Taylor Instrument Companies, because I really wanted to work on instruments and sensors. I, mean, I like to measure. I like to see things that can measure things. And it turns out also control them. So we picked up from Ann Arbor, my wife and I, and moved to Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm. And I started out doing work in the research division, or research department, under the engineer, chief engineer, whose name was Carl Hubbard. And I met some very interesting people there. I met a man by the name of Ken Tate, who was one of the designer, one of the chief designers of instruments. P.R. Jameson, who headed the factory. Uh, H.L. Mason, who was head of the research department. Mm -hmm. So I started working on 
on something that had been started by a previous fellow there, which is trying to see if you can improve on a recent controller that they had put together. It had been designed really mostly by Ken Tate. Mm -hmm. Now, the way the company was organized, it was a president, a general sales manager, chief engineer, and, and vice president, I think, and a controller. It may have been, there may have been a chief operating officer. This is in this, what I would have, would have classified now as rather small town of Rochester, New York. It's, of course, of course, a pretty good sized city. Was this project war related that you were working on here? None of this was war related. This was related to try, I mean, the, the work I was doing was related to trying to see if an improvement could be made on that controller. Mm -hmm. And the war was really fairly distant from most people's view in the United States, I think. Because yeah, I don't think that we entered the war until 1942 about. Yeah, end of 41. End of 41, yeah. In fact, Pearl Harbor hadn't even taken place. So there I am working away at this. My wife and I live in a place not too far from where I work. And as I recall, my son Paul, as the oldest child, was born there in 19... 41, I believe, December 18th, 1941. And of course, we had all of the problems that go with a brand new child, including having to have a dishwasher, having to have a washing machine. Didn't have, the dishwashing was done manually in those days. Yeah. But the washing machine, there was a wonderful new invention called a automatic washing machine, which had a rotating drum in it. I think it was a Bendix. So we had a Bendix washing machine. You had to fasten it down to a cement slab, but, or at least to the floor. So we got that fastened down, and we were, I think, out on St. Paul Street, which is sort of north of the center of the city. So there we were ensconced, and here I am from time to time working on, oh, and time goes on. Yeah, sooner or later, uh, you end up down at uh, MIT. Your work at Taylor takes well, you down MIT to work the, on the differential analyzer, I think. In the, in, by this time, the war has started. Well, the U.S. is in the war, I should say. The war had started before then. I think the war started about 39, really. Yeah, in Europe. In Europe. And of course, there were America, what were called America Firsters around who were dead set against any involved foreign involvement by the United States. And I must confess, this looked a little sensible at one time, sometimes, but at other times it didn't. Especially when I remembered back as to why it was that I had chosen to go into physics. Because back when I was in high school, Uh, I had read in the newspaper about a famous physicist who had visited the United States. His name happened to be Albert Einstein. Mm. And I don't know, nowadays probably people don't realize that, that that made the headlines of all the newspapers, even the local, even the, even the small town newspapers recorded that Albert Einstein had visited the United States. And of course, someplace along the line, he not only visits the United States, he comes and stays in the United States at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Yeah. In fact, I think he f probably was the first director of it. 
So uh, I wasn't at all sure that I was in sympathy with anybody who who didn't believe we should go over and knock the socks off those guys over there, which of course had been done in World War One anyway. But it's one of your old professors at Michigan, though, that gets you well, motivated. Well, so that nevertheless, this. so here I am working on this job at Taylor, seeing if I can improve on this. Con if there's any way that one can improve on the controller, well, one of the obvious ways is to put another derivative in it. It already had a proportional response, an integral response, and a first derivative response. And I'll call it first derivative, although there were people that called that, even that one second derivative. Uh, but it's so, and you could build a pneumatic analog, but that wouldn't work very well because it was hard, hard to do, hard to keep it working right. And I had heard of this wonderful machine at MIT called the Bush differ Mechanical Differential Analyzer yeah. that Vannevar Bush had built. And some of his students had continued to work it, and it was even, even available to, to uh, if, if, if a company wanted to go there, you could lease time on that machine and use it. Mm -hmm. And they would supply you with a, an operator or a kind of a maintenance man. So eventually the company decided to send me to MIT and have me do this solution on this remarkable mechanical differential analyzer. So my wife and I pack up and Or did his I go? I think you were down there in the I think that I packed, I think I just took the train over there. Yeah. It was quite a long ways from Rochester to, especially quite confusing because when you get into Boston, you get into South Station in those days, and I wanted to get to Cambridge. Well, it turns out there's a train that goes from Cambridge, from train that goes over from Boston to Cambridge which is just across the river. Well, I don't think I took the train over, because that turns out to be the Boston Main Train, and you really should take it from North Station instead of from South Station. But nevertheless, I get over to MIT, and I start using this differential analyzer. And I, while I'm doing this, I decide that I want to well, I, I have to apply this controller to some process. This was, this, these controllers were used to control uh, distillation columns in oil refineries. They were used to control cookers for cooking canned food. All, all kinds of things like that. And a, a, th a three-term controller could do all of those. And so here I am, wandering around in the main building at MIT, and uh, lo and behold, I run into Professor Gouchman. Now, he was one of my professors at the University of Michigan in physics department. And I say, well, what are you doing over here? Oh, he says, I'm here, and so is, so is Professor Ullenbeck. I said, well, he said, well, why don't you come back to my office for a moment? And we get back to his office, and he says, well, I can't tell you what we're working on, but what we're working on is very important. Why don't you chuck that job and come out and join us? <laughs> well, he was pretty persuasive. So eventually, on the strength only of his statement, I did leave Taylor Instrument and move to Cambridge and joined the Radiation Laboratory. At the Radiation Laboratory, I was put in a group that was trying to make a 
an auto tracking pointing radar work. It had a it had a control on the azimuth, and I guess on the elevation also. And they were going to put this radar, as I recall, the first time they were going to put it down near the Panama Canal on land. Mm -hmm. Well, as time went on, it, well, but the doggone control that they had, they had purchased from, well, a reputable supplier, namely Sperry Gyroscope, or Sperry. No, Sperry Gyroscope, I guess it was. Or it might have just been the Sperry Corporation in those days. And they had used Thyrotrons to control some uh, small, like sixth horsepower AC motors. Well, the Thyrotrons were put in there because they didn't want to make relays that would shatter. But it turns out that Thyrotrons can shatter also. And this darn thing would never stabilize. So I'm I'm given I'm put up on the roof of Building Six and. Ernie Pollard says, well, can't you fix it? Well, I looked at it and I, I didn't see how to fix it. But some way or other it was suggested that why don't, why don't you go over and spend some time in this servo mechanisms laboratory that was operated by Dr. Gordon Brown in the electrical engineering department. So I went over there, and while I'm there, I meet guys that are already working in that laboratory. One of them was Albert C. Hall, that many of you control people may know about. I met a Evan Edwards, who had been at the Taylor Instrument Company, had moved and was working in that laboratory. And the long and short of it is, I finally ended up replacing those motors with Vickers transmissions, hmm. Vickers hydraulic transmissions, which had also been used to make to make machine gun mounts move and things like that in airplanes. They were, but they could have a 440 volt motor on them and run off 60 cycles, or for that matter, off 50 cycles. And it had electronics to control, and it had a torque motor in it that would that could move a valve and open and close the hydraulic system. and All in all, you could make a real good controller with it. In the meantime, I had arranged to try to make some measurements on some of these antenna mounts. And it turned out that one of the, that the mount that we were using seemed to have a pretty low frequency response. I mean, if you shook this, put an AC electric signal into it, it had a, like, five, I think it was like five hertz response. And the only thing I could see that should be re doing anything of this was that the oil might be compressible. It turned out it was quite compressible because it had some air in it. Hmm. So you had to, if you really wanted to get this thing working right, you had to de aerate yeah. the hydraulic fluid, which is common practice after that. In the meantime, they decided they wanted this antenna not on, well, I mean, they would they put one of these on land, but nevertheless, the Navy needed one on board a ship. And furthermore, they needed it on board a ship, and they needed to put what are called IFF antennas on the front of the, this, and they wanted to automatically track an incoming airplane or an outgoing airplane, or a crossing airplane, and be able to, by radio, tell a pilot who might be in an airplane how to, how to, where, to, where to fly to get to that approaching, or that enemy aircraft. But, you wanted, but they also wanted to be able to point the antenna at this guy when he wanted to come in and land on the carrier to be sure that he was the right guy. Yeah. <laughs> and so we finally got all of that working, and that became a Navy, a standard piece of Navy equipment. Became the SP, or later, SP was its first name, but it later became the SM radar. And 
needed to have a gear train and a couple of gear trains in it and needed to be put on top up up high on the and up high on the island of the carrier of a carrier actually on the mast probably up above up, there yeah up on a on the island well up above the island yeah and in fact an island is unfortunately not in the center of the carrier <laughs> it's at the side so when you climb up this mast above the island to where the antenna was, that's a pretty horrendous experience. You can see the water down there and anyway, so I climbed up this, oh, well, we finally get this thing installed on board the USS Lexington, the new Lexington and the Essex, an Essex class carrier. Mm. I think the Essex may have been the first one, but the second one may have been the, the new Lexington. The old Lexington, in the meantime, had been sunk at Pearl Harbor. And these are big ships, about 900 feet long. Yeah. The Essex was, I think, Essex class was the biggest that could get through the Panama Canal. Yeah. Was deliberately designed that way, I think. Mm -hmm. So they get this thing up on there, and I get up on, well, and I, and I go with it. While they drive, they, they, I'll say they drive the ship, they don't, they, they, they f sail, the, no, they don't sail the ship. What do you do? You, you, we drive them. Yeah. You, drive, you drive the ship from... I don't think that's the way the captain described it, but nevertheless, they, they take the ship from Boston, South Boston Navy Yard, to Norfolk. And by the way, when we landed at Norfolk, I am still absolutely astounded how something the size of that ship is able to be brought up to a dock and not knock the dock over. Very slowly. It's tugs. brought up very slowly, and tugs do it, and tugs even stop it from going yeah. too fast. Yeah. So we get into Norfolk. So here is this ship, an aircraft carrier. It's a, essentially a brand new class carrier. Mm -hmm. And the ad, and the admiral comes aboard. Not only the admiral, a, 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 a some flying jockeys come aboard with their. I think he was, later became an admiral. I think he was a captain then or something. I'm if he not, was in charge of the ship, he was a Captain Sharp, probably. Was no, it. well, the ship, the man in charge of the ship was Admiral Sharp. Yeah. But there was a, a, a Webster. Yeah, probably a captain. He may have been a captain. He was, he, it was his pilots who were going to land on this ship. And in fact, the first thing he tries to do is to convince me that I ought to, well, I, by the way, I had helped put this on the ship, and it even had a, an auxiliary power supply in case the ship's power went out because the guys down in the engine room couldn't keep the turbines going, I guess. Uh, so we had installed a rather large, a 400 horsepower, as I recall. Oh, hang, the darn thing was like six feet in diameter for the three-phase motor and six feet in diameter connected to it for a three-phase alternator to generate 440, 60 cycles. So that was the spare supply for this SM antenna radar. So it was, it, it had all, it had redundancy, the whole shooting match. And we had PPIs and all the stuff in a, in a CIC room. We used a stable vertical that was there. So here we are, now in Norfolk, and Admiral Sharp decides, well, or somebody decides that they're going to move from Norfolk up to Annapolis, which is just up the bay the ways, up Chesapeake Bay. And the, the, uh, so he starts steaming the ship up the bay. And he, he's watching the PPI, which is up in the command center where he is. So he can see any other ships he can, he in the He can harbor. see any other ships. He can see the shoreline, everything that's around there. Well, I think a Navy man turned loose on something like that. He wants to see what that ship will do. I was told that he opened it up to 30 knots or whatever, whatever flank speed flank is, 30 speed to 32 knots, yeah. and he goes steaming right up to Annapolis. 
Through the fog. Through the fog, yes. <laughs> well, but he could see what was going on. Maybe nobody else could see him, but he could see him. <laughs> or his navigation officer. I'm not quite sure. It might, it might not have been him. It might have been his navigation officer. So they... I, I can remember standing alongside that thing and watching out from the deck. And here we go past a, a poor, I think it was a Greek freighter. He's anchored in the bay. And this great big ship goes whooshing past him. Missed him nicely, didn't cause him any trouble. But I suspect he thought his prayers had been answered. <laughs> We get up to Annapolis, and I call my wife in, in, uh, well, in fact, I called my office, I guess, and called my wife in Cambridge, called my office, said it worked like a charm. I guess I left out one thing about that trip from Boston town to Norfolk. On the way from Boston to Norfolk, we... We weren't steaming at 30 knots, by the way, in that time, but we were out in the open ocean. And out in the open ocean, even a 600-foot ship rolls and pitches. I got pretty sick at times, especially when they served curry in the, <laughs> and I was foolish enough to eat it. But also about halfway down, the Antenna stopped to work. Well, the power went out. That auxiliary power I was telling you about went out. So there I have to climb up that blasted mast and see if I can figure out what's wrong. Well, it turned out to be quite simple, and it finally made something understandable to me that hadn't been understandable before on Navy regulations about electrical systems. One of the regulations is that anything that's installed up on a mast must be able to be used as a, as a step ladder. And this 440 volt motor had attached to the side of it the three wires and the cable that connected it to drive it. And they were attached with 1232 screws, three of them I think. It was just a regular junction box like you use in your house maybe. That is not a suitable stepping stone. <laughs> Somebody had stepped on it. Uh. So that's why the power went off. So I had to fix that, which I did get fixed. I think I had to get that sent down by, I had to get some, I had to get a proper junction box set down and fastened to that motor. It didn't hurt the motor, it just, it just, uh, just wouldn't run anymore. <laughs> I'm glad that Admiral Sharp didn't hit anybody in the harbor, otherwise he might then become uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yes. I think we could stop right here for a minute. There was another little problem on board the ship. One of the 